conservatism. So it is my pleasure to introduce David Davenport. Thank you, Christy. It's great um, to be with you today. Um, this is somewhat familiar territory for me, except long, long ago. I uh, worked in uh, Senator Bob Dole's office, which I suppose dates me. And uh, no, this is a newer building than from my time, but sort of know the hallowed halls and some, something about the work that you do. So thank you for taking a break to be here today. You're brave to come and listen to me in particular. In an earlier career, I was an attorney, uh, which is a group not always known for its brevity of speech. Uh, and now for a long time I've been an academic, which is a group not known for its clarity of speech. Uh, so as I said, you're brave to come on a, on a Friday to hear what I have to say. But I thought I'd begin uh, with the 2012 election. Uh, and as I'm sure you're aware, after that election, uh, many people proclaimed the death of modern American conservatism. Uh, one commentator said the Titanic is sinking, uh, referring to American conservatism. Uh, another one observed that uh, the conservative arguments we heard in this election are going to be relics in a museum very shortly. Uh, lots of people said that conservatism really needed to change both its message and its methods if it was ever going to win uh, an election again. It's still uh, being debated today. I noticed in this morning's Wall Street Journal, uh, Governor Scott Walker of Wisconsin has a piece uh, talking about what conservatives need to do to be relevant. Uh, his thought is they don't need to give up their principles, they need to be stronger on their principles and, and that people are looking for uh, that kind of uh, leadership. And so in this book, uh, we talk about that in the final chapter of this book. Uh, my co-author Gordon Lloyd from, from the Pepperdine School of Public Policy and I talk about the future of conservative, uh, conservatism in the last chapter. But we really begin elsewhere. Uh, and uh, uh, the great writer Pearl Buck said, if you want to understand today, you have to search yesterday. And so in this book, our thought is to go back, historically, to come back to today. In other words, it's, it's not really a history book uh, in the sense that we go back to live in, in, in an earlier era, but we go back to understand the roots of conservatism in order to come back to public policy and politics uh, today. And the question is, where do we go back to find the roots of modern American conservatism? The conventional wisdom is you go to the 1950s. Uh, Russell Kirk, a uh, great conservative uh, political philosopher, William F. Buckley in the 1950s, uh, National Review Magazine was launched uh, during the 50s. And so the conventional wisdom is that's where you find the beginning of modern American conservatism. Uh, and then Amity Schles this year wrote, I think, a very interesting book on Calvin Coolidge and proposed, no, we ought to go further to the 1920s because really Calvin Coolidge was uh, the, the beginning of modern American conservatism. And she, I, I saw her a week or so ago and I said, you've really launched a Coolidge is cool movement. And uh, I said that probably wasn't easy to do because, uh, you know, you see the cover of the book, the top hat, he's not really a 2000, 21st century kind of guy. Uh, but Gordon and I in this book think the place to go is actually to the 1930s because in our view, modern American conservatism is essentially a response to the New Deal of the 1930s, to Franklin Roosevelt. And to us, uh, the conservative response in the 1930s was the beginning of modern American conservatism. And that response initially actually came from former President Herbert Hoover. Now, lots of people debate how conservative Hoover was as a president and as a Secretary of Commerce in the 1920s, and I'm, I'm happy to talk about that in Q&A if you'd like. But we're looking at him in the 1930s when he was shocked, really, by the excesses of the New Deal. Uh, the 1930s, the New Deal was really the height of progressivism. And we argue in this book that just as Edmund Burke, uh, the English political philosopher, uh, began modern conservatism as a response to the French Revolution, we think there's a distinctive brand of modern American conservatism. And that, in effect, the New Deal was our French Revolution. The New Deal changed politics, it changed governance. Uh, and so responding to our own French Revolution, Herbert Hoover starts, we think, to stake out the case for modern American conservatism. And if you think about it, in, in our view, we are still operating under the New Deal paradigm today. Uh, we argue that politics, American domestic policy, American economic policy today are essentially just continuations of the New Deal. So this debate that started 80 years ago 
between progressives and conservatives, between Roosevelt and Hoover in the 1930s, really is the frame, it was the frame of the 2012 debate, as I'm going to illustrate in just a moment, and we think is still the frame uh, for, uh, uh, for today. Uh, and in fact, uh, if you listen uh, to the debates in the 2012 election, uh, you really heard echoes of, of really all the themes that I'm going to talk about today. So in our book, we look at three areas uh, where Herbert Hoover and Franklin Roosevelt debated in the 30s and where we think that is still a key debate today. Uh, and the first of those is liberty versus equality. This is one of the fundamental debates between progressives and conservatives. Uh, and if you've read uh, some of your American history, uh, you'll remember that when the French journalist de Tocqueville came to America in the 19th century, he observed that one of the main differences between the French Revolution and Republic and the American Revolution and Republic is that the French were really all about egalité, equality. Uh, they talked about liberty, but they were really all about equality. And he said, by contrast, the Americans and the American Revolution is really about liberty. Uh, they also talk about equality, but what they're really after in America is liberty. And this was one of Herbert Hoover's biggest complaints about the New Deal, uh, is that it was turning America into a form of European totalitarianism. Um, Her Hoover had spent uh, his, the early part of his career as a mining engineer, doing huge mining projects abroad, including in Europe. Uh, and he had continued to live in Europe when he did relief efforts, big food, uh, relief efforts during uh, World War I and in the post-war era. In fact, if you travel in Belgium especially, but other countries in Europe, Herbert Hoover is a hero for essentially saving the Belgian people uh, from starvation as well as in other countries. But one of the things Hoover noticed during all that time in Europe was that it was giving way to various forms of totalitarianism, socialism, communism, eventually uh, Nazism, uh, fascism. Uh, and then he came back to this country and he, and he was shocked because in the 1930s he thought Roosevelt was voluntarily turning us over to forms of European totalitarianism. And in fact, if you look at two sort of cartoon icons of the 1930s, if you will, Herbert Hoover liked to talk about the rugged individual and Herbert, uh, I'm sorry, Franklin Roosevelt said, no, it's really about the forgotten man. These are, these are really two great cartoon icons of the 1930s. Uh, Hoover, Hoover argued America is about equality of opportunity, and it's about individuals having the freedom to decide how they want to live their lives and to pursue that. Uh, and, and so America is about equality of opportunity. Franklin Roosevelt said, and this is actually a little shocking to me, he said straight out in the 1930s, equality of opportunity is dead in America. You, you can't get it anymore. And so what we have to be about in this country is equality of outcomes. We have to design public policy around the forgotten man, or, or sometimes he said around every man, not around uh, individual freedom. And this, I think, is precisely uh, the debate today uh, when people uh, talk about income inequality and how we need to raise taxes on the wealthiest and we need to raise the minimum wage what they're really arguing for is this equality of outcomes kind of uh, society. And so this is, this is the way, the form in which that debate uh, is continuing today. And so uh, we, we go into this in our book. I don't have a, enough time to really go into it in depth today. But if you look at the data, the data is not as clearly supportive of, of that there are massive income inequality problem, problems as it is sometimes claimed. I'm sure you all rushed out to see Robert Reich's new documentary about in, income inequality. Uh, it's hot in California. Maybe it's not quite as hot here uh, in Washington, D.C. Um, and, and we also argue, I think even, even more importantly, is income inequality even the right question to be asking in an equality of opportunity society? Uh, isn't the right question income mobility? Are people able to move up and down the income scale, not whether their incomes are actually equal? And when you look at studies of income mobility, what you find is we still have a great deal of mobility uh, of income in this country. There were two, unfortunately, these kind of studies lag time-wise. Uh, they're very comprehensive, difficult to do. But two studies of income mobility from 1996 to 2005 point out that we have a great deal of income mobility. It divides income into f the five quintiles. And from that study, 
what you find is half of the taxpayers.